Hi there, and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. This is Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits, and I'm here to hopefully answer some of your questions. Uh, they are mostly focused on knitting, but sometimes we also chat about some spinning or some sewing, maybe a little weaving. And today I'm really excited because I have got some show and tell to show everybody. Let's start with my sweater. So this is Sprite. I just released it this week. It is knit up in Ritual Dyes Sprite. I have a number of patterns where naming patterns is hard. And sometimes the yarn name is so good, I just steal that. So this is Sprite. I, my dear friend Rachel, who owns Ritual Dyes, was knitting with this like icy glacial blue yarn last summer when we saw each other and I immediately was like what is that and thankfully she then was like it's a new color we can get you some so I also happen to be obsessed with this like red poppy color I could kind of show you on my like little sleeve cuff here um that's called jewel weed and I just love these two colors together. They're kind of an unexpected color match, um, but I just love them together. So I knew I wanted to do something with them, but when it was time to start designing, they only had one lone skein of the jewel weed left. So I knew I had to make it work with just one skein of this beautiful poppy red. So I did some corrugated ribbing and I actually thought it might be fun if I kind of shared a little bit of my design process. So I'm actually going to grab my swatch. And while I'm over here, you can see my pants. These were in the photo shoot and I got lots and lots of questions about these pants. So um, they are very wrinkly right now because, you know, I wear my clothes. And uh, they are the berry pants. So if you've been watching or hanging out around here or my Instagram or my newsletter for a while, you may know that I love the berry pants pattern. It is from, I always get it mixed up. It's either style arc or arc style. I forget which. I should have that memorized because I've linked to them so often. Um, it's a size inclusive pattern. I can't remember the hip measurements it goes between. Um, but I do alter it a little bit. I don't do the bucket top. It has a bucket top on it. I just do a traditional waistband, elasticized waistband on it. And I add butt pockets. I think that's all the changes I make. Um, it seems to run pretty true to size for me, at least. And we're like, if you've seen, they also have the bob pants, which are very, very popular. Those ones run a bit big. Um, so if you have made the bob pants, don't assume they're going to be the same because bob pants I have to size down quite a bit. Berry pants are pretty much like right on target. Um, but yeah, I just did them in this fun gingham fabric and I felt like as I was sewing them, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm totally going to wear those with my Sprite sweater. So here we are. Anyways, let's talk about a little design inspiration. I'm just going to take a little sip of coffee. Okay, so Here's my little swatchy swatch. I never know how to make things like this, like focus where I want you to. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> so here's my swatch. And sometimes when I am just feeling like, has everything been done? Um, <laughs> I need new inspiration. I need something to get excited about again. I will pull up my search dictionaries and I will just start making swatches. And this pattern is from one of the Barbara Walker stitch dictionaries, the top of it. I've actually used it before in a hat pattern, but as I was playing around, I realized that I could figure out how to increase within this texture pattern to make it grow like a yoke. So you can see this kind of already looks like a little yoke wedge. And that was the same process that I did for my wool and honey sweater. So if you've ever checked out, I wish I had brought it up. Um, it's downstairs in my sweater shelf. And that one has big slip, like elongated stitches, kind of similar to this. 
that create these honeycombs. And so I went through the same process with that where I was just sitting on my sofa one night playing around swatching and I just started increasing and it grew and I was like, oh my gosh, this could totally be a yoke. So very similar with this. And then I knew I wanted to add color though. I am very, very much color driven in my knitting. It is what excites me. It's what gets me to the end of a project. It's, there's infinite possibilities, you know, like with combining colors and using them differently. So I did want to add a little splash of color. So that was why at the bottom here, I was like, Ooh, I'm going to try out some corrugated ribbing. This yellow is from my stash. That is actually another color from ritual dyes that I cannot remember the name of off the top of my head but it is like my perfect yellow i love 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 that yellow color so anyways this was my little swatch and then as i was knitting it and i got to the bottom of this texture i just felt like it looked unfinished it's like i want i want to end it somehow it actually would be cute i think adding another little like corrugated ribbing underneath could also be cute but i didn't want to do that so i turn to the trusty bobble. I really love bobbles. I know they're not for everyone, but I think you should try. Try and get into them because they're really fun and they're so cute. And I love to use a crocheted bobble, which I find to just be a little perkier, a little rounder and more bobbly. Sometimes knit bobbles can fall a little flat. Um, so yeah, anyways, I ended it with that and then some more corrugated ribbing. So it's just a sweet, a sweet little sweater. And that is Sprite. I will link to it below. What else? Oh, maybe I'll, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump into some questions because I know some of you are just really here for those questions. So I'm going to jump into questions and then at the end I have a little more show and tell for anybody who wants to stick around. So one more sip of coffee and let's jump in. Y'all had some fantastic questions. I mean, you always do, but I love when they really get my mind turning and I'm like, ooh, that's you know, I just I find it really helpful. It helps me when I think about how I want to write a pattern because um, I see definitely some repeat questions that happen. I'm like, okay, how could this be looked at in the future? I don't know. Anyways, I digress. Let's jump in. Hello, Andrew. I am knitting the Weekender Light with a locally sourced and hand dyed yarn. Sounds awesome. It's two ply fingering weight and it has a mixture of pinks and yellows in the dye. I love pink and yellow together. I have noticed that the inside of the jumper, the knit side, so if you're not familiar with my Weekender pattern, the Weekender is what I like to call a fancy sweatshirt. It's a very, very comfortable, boxy, drop shoulder sweater, but looks nice. You could totally wear it to work. And it has a slip stitch seam going up the center of it. So to really make that slip stitch seam pop, I did the body of the sweater in reverse stockinette, also known as the pearl side of your work. So if we got any newbies here. Let me see if I can't turn this out. So this is the knit side and this is the pearl side, or it's also called reverse stockinette. Okay. Ba -da -ba -da -ba. I have noticed that the inside of the jumper, the knit side, seems to show the brightest colors, whereas the outside pearl side looks more subdued in terms of color. Now I'm doing the sleeves which have the knit stitches facing out. So with the Weekender I wanted to the sleeves to have a nice slim fit style and to I find that the reverse stockinette side um can almost look bulkier even though it's technically not. It's the same fabric. So I did stockinette sleeves on the sleeves. <laughs> Let's go back to our question. Um, I am noticing that they don't quite match the body color wise. Is this a thing? Do the knit stitches somehow show more color than the pearl? I have loved knitting this pattern and will wear this jumper for sure, but if I make another, perhaps I should choose a more uniformly dyed yarn. Thanks so much. So I oh, and I love I have to throw this in too because they ended it with 
a huge thank you to Megan who has helped me so kindly and patiently with my project. So I, my amazing, amazing tech editor is also the person behind my DRK pattern help email line that is there to help with pattern specific questions. She knows, she's the only other person that knows my patterns as well as me because she's my editor and she's just so kind and amazing. And um, I just had to make sure to put that note in so that if Megan ever watches this, she knows how much people appreciate her amazing help because she really does a great job. So back to this question. Um, I am just gonna gather my thoughts here for a minute. Yes, what I have found in my own experience with fading which if you are new to my work um, or new to fading, I went through a big old fading phase where I would move from one color to the next, trying to fade through the yarn to kind of transition and create my own gradients. And what I found was that reverse stockinette and garter stitch were really the best stitches for fading they really blended the yarn better and broke up the color so that it was a more cohesive look. So that is why in my later faded sweaters, such as the Comfort Fade Cardi or the Rose Cardigan, I had the reverse stockinette side, the pearl side, be the right side of the sweater, the side that faces out to the world. So that is exactly, uh, it sounds like what is happening with your lovely hand-dyed weekender. So I did want to say a couple of things here. Yes, you're definitely not just like seeing things. I think you may notice more than anyone else ever will. So if you, by the time you watch this episode, if you watch this episode, have already completed your sweater and it's good to go, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But if it's bothering you that those sleeves do look a bit brighter than the body, you absolutely can knit those sleeves in reverse stockinette. So what you would want to do is, you're gonna have to purl them. I mean, it's just a little bit tricky. You absolutely can pick up stitches to have your pick up stitch seam be showing. You'll just have to play with that. Um, because what you want to do, if you wanted to still be able to knit those sleeves instead of having to purl every round, then you would want to turn your sweater inside out, pick up stitches and knit the sleeve. And you just have to make sure that when you pick up the sleeve, pick up the stitches for the sleeve, you're not, you know, usually we go in right through the top and we pick up and knit a stitch and that makes a seam that you only see on the inside of the sweater. But if you're doing it inside out so that you can knit instead of purl, you have to come at it in a different direction so that that seam stays on the side it needs to be on. I hope that makes sense. Um, or if that's like, I don't know how to do that. You could absolutely pick up the stitches as it tells you to in the pattern and then just purl every round instead of knitting every round um, and have a completely reverse stockinette sweater. You don't have to do the sleeves knit style. So that's an option, even if you have finished your sweater but it's bothering you, you could always tear those back out and redo them that way. Um, so there is an idea for that and yeah, just, um, Pearl sides of work or garter stitches are always going to blend colors better than the knit side. In my experience is what I have found. All right. I have a question about decreasing for sleeves. It's so confusing to me when the pattern says something like decrease every five rounds. Does that mean I'm decreasing on the fifth round and there are only four rounds between each decrease? Or am I knitting five rounds and then decreasing on the sixth round? therefore having five rounds between each decrease round. So I totally understand why that's confusing because it could really be interpreted either way. Um, so I have a few thoughts here. Um, to me, if I was gonna read that and the pattern says decrease every five rounds, I would knit five rounds, decrease, knit five rounds, decrease. I, if it's written decrease, on every fifth round, then you would knit four rounds, decrease every fifth. Um, but here's the thing, decreasing one round less or more shouldn't overly impact your sweater unless you have to decrease a lot, depending on how many sleeve decreases there are. So what I would do, 
just to set your mind at ease. So basically I wanna answer this question, giving you the tools to do a little investigative work to, so that you can have the confidence to proceed without having to worry about if you've read that, how the designer intended. I myself do try really hard when I have to give an instruction similar to that to make it really clear with like, let's say, cause another one will be like, decrease 12 times after they've shown you the decrease and people are like 12 times in addition to the decrease round I just did or 12 times more like it can be confusing so I personally try to really like make that obvious by saying more or total and italicizing and bolding so that it doesn't leave you guessing but um for something like this what I would do is I would go back and I would look at your row gauge and if they gave it to you per four inches or 10 centimeters, that's just a quick little bit of math. You would take, let's say it is 20 rounds or rows is four inches or 10 centimeters. You would just take 20 and divide it by four, which would give you five rows or rounds per inch or two and a half centimeters. So that's what you want. You want your number of rows or rounds per a smaller segment such as an inch and then I would go back and I would look at for your size how many times they are having you decrease every five rows so let's say they are having you decrease 50 times I'm sorry not 50 times I was already doing math in my head that would be a very very long sleeve let that got me teeny little. Let's say they're having you do that 10 times, okay? So you have to decrease every five rounds 10 times. So if you were to decrease on every fifth round, that would be 50 rounds. If you were to knit five rounds and then decrease on the sixth, that would give you 60 rounds. So that is a difference of 10 rounds, which if you, if your row gauge for that pattern is one inch or two and a half centimeters for every five rounds, that's a difference of two inches or five centimeters in where you're going to end up on that sleeve. So then you can look at your schematic and how long is that sleeve supposed to be? If you go with the first, or let's say you go with the second option, which is kind of what I want to default to, but I can also see, I feel like the designer would maybe actually be implying the first, because I can very much see a designer going, okay, I need them to decrease five times in 50 rounds. So I'm going to divide 50 by 10. So they need to decrease every five rounds, which like now that I'm working my way through this, I do wonder if they mean like every fifth round. They might. So that's why we can do this investigative work to try and figure it out. So if decreasing every sixth round because you're knitting five rounds between each is going to land you two inches too long for where you need to land to start your cuff, then you need to do it the other way. You need to actually decrease on every fifth round, only knitting four in between. Um, so doing a little bit of math like that, you can help see where that's going to land you. Also, the other, uh, little bit you could take into account for is, is there a stitch pattern on those sleeves? If there is a stitch pattern on those sleeves. What's the repeat? Because that's what they might be trying to hit is, um, I need you to decrease on the fifth round of this repeat to not mess up the repeat with your decreases. Um, so I generally in my patterns go by measurement for decreasing, not by number of rounds, unless it's specific to a stitch pattern. So that can give you a clue if there is a stitch pattern into where they might be wanting you to decrease. So I know that was a lot and I threw all kinds of math in there. So I hope that kind of makes sense and gives you some confidence in trying to sort out what each individual designer meant because I do think they could mean different things uh, but yeah as I got to the end there I actually kind of think the first way which would be to decrease every five rounds but that's why I try not to write it this way because I think it's confusing too so if you have a very opinion big opinion on what that means feel free to throw it in the comments <laughs> we can all learn together 
Okay. Next question. Why do designers sometimes specify holding two yarns together, for example, DK's plus a lace weight, rather than the weight of yarn these two make when combined, for example, Aaron? I would actually challenge that being an Aaron weight. Um, does holding two yarns make a difference in some way? Can I substitute the final weight and get the same mix, same effect? P.S. Hello from East Lansing. Hi. Um, so East Lansing is my hometown. Um, to me, DK plus lace would be worsted weight. And I'm only mentioning it because I wonder if you're working on a pattern that calls for specifically that. And I would definitely do a gauge swatch because not all yarns are equal. And you might have, sometimes a DK weight can feel real similar to a sport or real thick, like a worst, like real thicker, like a worsted. Um, but to me, it would be worsted plus lace would equal an Aran weight. DK plus lace would equal a worsted weight. Um, so just make sure you swatch if you do hold two together, but it looks like you're trying to not hold two together. So I try to, in my patterns, let me just back up to the beginning of your question because I feel like I'm just being confusing after the last question of lots of math. Okay, let's start with does holding two yarns or why do designers specify holding two yarns? Generally speaking, it is for a specific effect. Either they are adding in, if it's lace, I'm guessing they're holding maybe some lace mohair in there and they want to add a halo to the sweater. I'm guessing you're going to knit a sweater, but it could be anything. Um, I'm guessing they want to add a halo to that knit project. Um, or it could be marling. It could be for color. Generally, if it's marling, a lot of times a designer might ask you to hold two of the same weight together, but it doesn't have to be that way at all, as long as you get the final desired thickness. Um, so generally speaking, if a designer tell you to hold two yarns together, one yarn's adding something special, whether it be a shift in the color or texture. Most often it's texture, it's something like mohair to add halo, a little fuzz to the project. And you can absolutely sub in the final weight. So I actually try to mention that in my patterns where I have held two yarns together. I like the Daydreamer, for instance, in that sweater, I held a fingering weight and a lace weight together for the halo effect. I also know not everyone likes a fuzzy yarn, not everyone likes mohair. So I have put in the pattern that you could also sub in a sport weight yarn instead of the two yarns held together. Um, because yeah, that's the great thing about being a knitter is you do you, you can, however you prefer it. If you would rather just do a single strand of something in there, that's totally fine. Um, just make sure you get gauge. That's where gauge swatching is gonna be important. I mean, it's always important, but you know what I mean. All right, I finished up. I finished up. I finished up. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm gonna take one more sip of coffee. My mouth and my brain are not talking to each other today. All right. I finished knitting a bottom-up sweater a few months ago. Sizing turned out well after blocking it, but I have worn it a few times before the heat in Arizona kicked in and it got too hot to wear. After wearing it, I realized I would like to have it longer in the body. It was knit bottom up, starting with a few rows of two by two rib into garter stitch. What would you suggest for fixing it? Thanks. So I have a couple suggestions and you can see what you prefer. I think that the quickest would be to cut your ribbing off very carefully and you could even cut like halfway into your ribbing and then unravel or you could just cut off the very bottom cast on edge and just unravel it and then you're going to work down in garter stitch and until you've added the length you want to add and then redo your two by two rib the nice thing about garter stitch is the problem with knitting in two different directions is when you've been knitting in one direction doo -doo -doo -doo, and then you decide to go to where you started and in the other direction, you're gonna be a half stitch off. It's just the way it works. But in garter, I think it's gonna hide that pretty well. Um, so I think you're actually, you're not gonna notice the direction change very much at all. 
you could also just cut off because it doesn't sound like you had to do much ribbing if you i i can like kind of a deep rib on a hem so your other option to really hide any stitch change even more would again cut off that cast off at cast on edge unravel it up to the garter and then just immediately go into ribbing and knit extra ribbing to extend the length and i think that'll hide it even more so that would be the quick option if you are afraid to cut into your cast on and that just all seems a little scary you can go the long route but it's gonna basically be re-knitting like more than half the sweater so what you would want to do is take out your bind off edge you would pr i'm guessing you probably picked up the sleeves and knit them down so yeah this would be the not fun way to do it because you would end up having to prop yeah you'd have to take those out as well um basically you would take out this whole part so from here up so your sleeves and your yoke you would then up extend the body the extra length you want it and then re-knit your yoke and your sleeves um i would do the first way personally and i think you can do it i think it'll be great um just take it slow and when you're unraveling once you're getting about a row away from where you want to put it on your needles and start being able to knit again what i do then like i unravel and then when I'm one or two rows away, I start unraveling stitch by stitch while inserting my needle back in. So I, you know, I put a needle in into that stitch, then unwrap the next one. And I keep going through like that and it feels a lot more manageable. So that's what I would do. And good luck, it'll be great and it'll be worth it because you want your sweater to be perfect so that you can wear it, you know? Um, so yeah, do it. We believe in you. We'll be here cheering you on okay wow are we already to the last one did i skip any nope all right last one so i don't think i've ever talked we have talked wrap and turns here i don't think i've answered this question though and it is one i get quite a bit and i'm gonna be really curious about how all y'all are feeling about your short rows so this is my last sip of coffee sadly no, it's good. Um, I'm gonna take this and we're gonna dive right in. Okay, short rows. I'm a lifelong crocheter and finally have gotten into knitting within the past year. Yay, welcome. Um, but um, I am working on a weekend or late for your knit along. Uh, so nice to have you join us. And wondered if you can share why you do wraps and turns instead of German short rows. Is there any advantage to one or the other? I'm not at all opposed to learning how to wrap and turn, but already know and love German short rows. If I wanted to convert to German short rows, do you have any advice? Thanks so much. So I get this one a lot. I think that German short rows might even be like, the preference of most knitters and so i would that is where i'm gonna start this i want to know from anyone watching do you have a favorite short row method because i get this one about german short rows a lot and i will go into why i use the wrap and turn method in patterns but i would just love to hear from everybody about if they do have a favorite method because you could sway me I can change and if I need to add German short rows to maybe more of my patterns I'd be open to that so here is why I default to wrap and turns basically because it tends to be the first way people learn obviously it wasn't for you <laughs> but a lot of times people learn to wrap and turn first and when we're talking about short rows, we're talking about you knit partway through your row, row, your row or your round, and then you turn your work and go back the other way, creating a shorter row within your longer one. And this is a great way to build up fabric to create things like the main place I use it is in the back neck of a sweater, which I did here. And that raises up the back neck so that the front neck is really comfortable and not doing this and kind of choking us. It helps it wear lower and more comfortable. 
Um, it can also be used to drop a back hem is a really lovely way to use it. And then sometimes people even use it for dark shaping for a bust. So there's lot, and then it can also just be decorative. I've used it in a lot of shawls. I love doing short rows and shawls. So there's so many applications to short rows. And I have absolutely talked about some different ways to learn short rows and everything in past episodes. You can always feel free to go back and watch some of my old ones for all those tips. But for, so for wrap and turns, it tends to be what people are familiar with before they branch out and they learn the other methods like German short rows, Japanese short rows, yarn over short rows. And I have used different short rows in my patterns before, but I do tend to default to the classic wrap and turn also because it's really concise to write that one out. So in a pattern, we do try to keep the amount of words, you know, as concise as possible. And wrap and turn is pretty there, you know. I do include definitions and more advice in how to resolve those wrap and turn short rows and exactly how to work them in my glossary and in my notes in my patterns. But when I think about German short rows, and maybe it's because they're not my go-to, but I'm not opposed to them. I mean, I like a German short row. Um, it always seemed like it would be a little bit wordier to explain it to somebody within a pattern who had never worked German short rows before. But I need, you know, I might just explore that because they are, they are pretty delightful to try out. So now, so that's why um, I just try to, it's hard, short rows are a method that actually describes why I love knitting because I love so much that pretty much you can find a method that you like with so many different techniques people have figured out different ways to do them. And short rows is such a prime example because there are so many ways to work a short row. I feel like you can kind of find your favorite. So um, let's jump to the second part of this question, which is if I wanted to swap out wrap and turns for German short rows, can I do that? You absolutely can. So I actually am gonna try to write out like a little bit of what I'm about to say down below in the show description so that if you need to be able to read it afterwards, it'll be there for you. But I'm also doing it with the assumption that you are already familiar with German short rows. So, so basically all you're going to do is, and it depends, it's going to vary a little bit on if your short rows are um, working within. So generally we knit one way, turn our work, do something to not create a giant hole, go the other way, we do the same thing. And then we're either gonna work within those two that we just framed out, getting smaller and smaller, less and less stitches, or we're gonna resolve those and keep working beyond them. So it depends on what kind of shape you are trying to achieve with your short rows. So I'll kind of go into both a little bit, but let's say just as a, an example, that your pattern tells you to knit 10, wrap and turn. You don't really have to change anything for that first one. You're basically, you're still going to knit 10, but where it says wrap and turn, just ignore the wrap and go ahead and turn, slip your stitch, and then pull the yarn over the needle to create what looks like that double stitch in German short rows. Now here's where you do have to change something. Let's say that working back the other way, the pattern tells you to again, purl 10. So we're going to work with the same number of stitches wrap and turn. Instead of purling 10, the stitch you just slipped and turned into a double stitch is technically the first stitch of that purl 10. So you would either have to count that within your 10 stitches to get to the point of your next turn or just reduce that number of stitches to purl by one. So you would purl nine. So the first stitch is your double and then you would purl nine more to get to that purl 10 that's written in the pattern before your wrap and turn. So got your double stitch, purl nine more, and now you're at your next turn. So again, forget the wrap, just turn your work, slip your stitch, pull the yarn over the top of the needle to create the double stitch. Now, here is where it depends on if you are gonna work within those two, getting smaller and smaller, or if you're gonna work beyond them. If you're gonna work within those two, 
it changes again just a little bit. So let's say the pattern says knit to one stitch before your previous wrap and turn. Instead of knitting to one stitch before where you turned, you're gonna knit all the way up to it. So you're gonna knit all the way up to where you see your double stitch, and then you'll turn, slip your stitch, and pull your yarn over. So now you're gonna have two double stitches sitting next to each other, which is what you want, because in the other um, method, in the wrap and turn method, you would have had two wrapped stitches sitting next to each other, so that's how you get it to be the same. So that's the same on the knit side or the purl side. Now let's pretend instead of working to before where you had previously turned, you need to work up to it, resolve it, and work a little bit more. So in that case, what you would do is, let's go back and pretend we've only done our first like knit side and purl side. So now the pattern might say, knit to your previous wrap and turn, resolve it, knit four, wrap and turn. So what we would do here is we would knit all the way up to our double stitch, which is our quote unquote like wrapped stitch, knit all the way up to it. Then you would knit your double stitch like a knit two together. So you would take both strands of that double stitch, work them together, and that resolves it beautifully. You work, you're not gonna have a hole. Now you would knit the four it tells you to in the pattern. And again, instead of a wrap and turn, you would forget the wrap, just turn, slip your stitch, pull your yarn over to create your double stitch. You would then purl back to your previous double stitch, which in your pattern would say your previous wrap and turn, purl all the way over to it, purl the two strands together, purl four, turn your work, slip your stitch, pull the yarn over for your double stitch. So it's pretty similar. It's really just remembering that in that first one, when you're first kind of like setting up your short rows, you are going to go one less stitch than what it calls for because your double stitch eats up one of the called for stitches in like that purl 10. Um, so there you go. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. I think it's pretty easy to swap out. I will put some little notes below though. If like, if you're like me, I sometimes I need to read it and then do it at the same time for that to make sense. So, um, you can absolutely sub in your favorite short row method. Okay, I think that's all of our questions today. So let's jump to a little show and tell. So this past week, I got to go to a backpack making class and it was one of the coolest things I think I've ever done. So I'm a big fan of Amber Jensen. If you have not heard of her before, she is an amazing artist and weaver, and she makes backpacks that look a little something like this. I have one of her backpacks, which is actually downstairs in my room, but in general, she does these beautiful weavings, and then she makes these really cute roll top like day packs. So she created a class for it, and I was so so excited to snag one of the very it was a small class and I managed to snag one of the spots and to go with two of my besties and so we got to weave so this is my weaving so we got to weave a few different panels so and then I ended up weaving three and then I picked two to use so I wove this and this and then we got to use industrial sewing machines to sew this wax canvas backpack. And then we even got to do leather work, um, punching the leather. I got to use a riveting machine, like this little like, it was so cool. Anyways, I'm so stoked. There's some hot pink wool felt in here. <laughs> and it was just the experience of a lifetime. It was so neat. And I'm so proud of what I made. <laughs> so there's my little, my brand new little backpack. Uh, and it just made me so excited to see how we can bring fiber arts into other really useful things in our life, like making a backpack. Um, I also thought I would share, this is actually my favorite piece that I wove over the weekend. It did not make it into the final backpack though, because um, my other two panels kind of coordinated it, coordinated a little bit better. I actually also love the back side of it. So I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. I have to decide. I thought about trying to make another bag, um, but I really love it. And it was it was just really neat, really fun. So um, yeah, I just, 
I don't usually get to take workshops. I usually teach some workshops. So it was really neat to be on the other side of that. And it made me curious to what, how do y'all feel? Do you ever go to workshops? Do you like to learn new crafts? And if so, or do you have a favorite workshop you've ever taken that you were just like, man, that really inspired me and also just made me feel like, wow, look what I can do. This is so cool. So that is that show and tell. I thought I had more show and tells. I showed you my pants. I showed you my sweater. Showed you my backpack. Maybe that was it. I talked about my design process. All right. Well, if there was something else, I will try to remember for next week. And we will end this here because this is a long one. So thank you so much for joining me as always. I hope to see you back here next week with a whole new round of questions. And speaking of workshops, I am going to try to do a little bit more teaching this year. So I've already booked out kind of the next year. They're slowly starting to roll out. So if you check out my events page, I will try to remember to add a link to that below. Um, then you can kind of see what's coming up and maybe you'll come take a class with me because I would love to see you and hopefully teach you something about knitting that maybe you didn't know before. So I hope you have a great weekend and yeah, I hope to see you back here next week. Bye everybody. Happy knitting.